Ah, Omori. This is a game which holds a very special place in my heart. There are games out there which have the capacity to really change you as a person. And for some, the barrier towards really accepting the impact of something meaningful isn't too awfully high. Some people have the ability to receive something truly meaningful and let its emotional impact resonate with them and change them for the better. Now, I'm not quite like that. For me, something really, really has to strike the right chord to force me out of my emotional shell. And as such, there are a few games out there which have been able to really get to me. But the point being, this is one of them. By its ingenious application of all the right devices converging together, Omori manages to create a story which has the ability to evoke a deep-rooted empathy, so convincing that it can even make you forget your own life while playing it. The characters and their dynamic is incredibly convincing. The pacing, although dragging a bit in some places, always manages to maintain your interest in the story while still appealing to your needs as an RPG player. But in particular, the symbolism of the game is so deep and extensive that I've often caught myself pondering on the things I didn't yet understand as I went about my day. And this is what I want to explore with you today. I've already seen other people go over the general meaning of the story and what makes the game good, so I'm not going to repeat too much of what's already been done, but I do feel that there are a few things which haven't been explored quite as much as I think they deserve, and so I'm going to do so here. Now, before I continue, be advised that <laughs> this video contains massive spoilers, mainly for the true route of the game, and Omori is a game which you absolutely have to experience for yourself if you want to let it impact you in the way it deserves to, so if you haven't played the game already, do so now. Besides, if you don't know anything about the game, this video probably isn't for you anyways, since I'm mainly going to focus on its use of symbolism and will assume that you already know all the trivial details about the game, although I will inevitably end up going over some other things as well. That being said, if you're one of those people, this is your cue to leave. Although I said I'd be focusing on the symbolism here, in order to meaningfully do so, I'd like to provide a brief synopsis of the game and its major events and characters. If you want to skip the summary and go straight to the analysis, please go to the timestamp on your screen now. In the game, we play as the eponymous protagonist, Omori. In the beginning, we wake up in a strange and monochrome room called White Space, seemingly a shell of a bedroom containing almost nothing, creating an eerie atmosphere which manages to stay at the back of your mind as a player for the rest of the dream world's admittedly jovial antics. Once we've acquainted ourselves and found a certain object, we can pass through the door into a seemingly much happier place. Here, we're acquainted with our good friends Kel, Hiro, Aubrey, Basil, and Mari. Kel is the doofus of the group, always ready to make everyone else either laugh or roll their eyes with his antics. Hiro is Kel's older brother and is the very embodiment of the mature and responsible kid, always looking out for his friends and making sure everyone gets along and stays out of trouble. Aubrey is the somewhat emotional yet giddy and optimistic girl who balances out Kel's explosive personality. Basil is the shy yet caring one who likes to tend to flowers, and Mari, Amori's sister, is the mom of the group, or the sister if you will, engaged in a somewhat low-key yet obvious and universally shipped romance with Hiro. And finally, of course, Amori is the quiet and apparently unemotional one, fittingly enough since he's a silent protagonist throughout almost the entire game. And Yet by the end of it, Omori, or rather Sunny, feels like one of the most fleshed out and interesting characters I for one have seen in a video game. In fact, if you're the right kind of person, he might even feel like you. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Moving on. Basil disappears in the aftermath of the first event, which shows us a glimpse of the game's, shall we say, less than jovial side, and we lose ourselves in a seemingly endless quest to find him, going on all manner of fantastic adventures 
which tempt us to forget why we're really here. Yet, we soon learn that all the various sporadic and over-the-top adventures we go on to find him are all part of a dream which has been dreamt again and again by a boy who has hidden the most horrifying truth imaginable from himself. We find hints of the truth scattered across the dreamscape and it's only when Sonny, the true protagonist of the game, wakes up that we learn that everything we've seen so far has been nothing but a lie created as a coping mechanism against reality. If we make the right choices as players, we meet Sunny's real friends, as they are now, painfully highlighting how things have changed and how Sunny is living in the past at the expense of the future. Soon, we learn the truth, or at least a part of it. Mari is dead, and the priceless and dynamic friend group we see in Sunny's dream world of headspace is nowhere to be found in reality anymore. This is what we must rebuild as we slowly untangle Sunny's tortured mind and conscience and painfully uncover the truth. Yes, the truth. You all know what I'm referring to, and if you don't, you already know way too much for not having played the game, so let me tell you again, go play it now. Now, let's get down to business. In this video, I'm going to be focusing on how various initially mysterious aspects of Sunny, the protagonist, escapist dream world headspace hint at and symbolically convey the existence of some greater truth hidden away in a superficially jovial landscape, and how the myriad of impressions slowly but surely converge on one thing, or rather world. Black Space. I would have loved to talk about Black Space too, but it's just too much for one video, so I'll constrain myself to what we see in Headspace here. That being said, I do have over 10,000 words of notes in a document on this game, so if you'd like more, feel free to comment, as I would really like to talk about Black Space and all the other parts as well. Now, the most interesting way the game creates a sense of mystery and engagement in the player is, in my opinion, the way that it leverages the idea of the truth as something hidden in the darkest crevices of Sunny's mind, and sprinkles breadcrumbs throughout the whole of Headspace to slowly allow us to form an idea about it as players. The game accomplishes this feat by its plethora of symbols and devices representing various parts of Sunny's mind and mental state. These breadcrumbs at first merely puzzle us and encourage us to form our own theories as we play, only slowly converging towards the coherent bird's eye perspective that we have by the ending of the game. One of the most central themes of Amori, perhaps the most central, is the act and state of repression. This condition, which Sunny is in for the majority of the game, is a point made explicit, but is also hinted at in subtle and less than subtle ways throughout Headspace. The state of repression is symbolized and enforced first and foremost by the character of Omori. Although we play as Omori in Headspace, it soon becomes clear that Omori and Sunny are not exactly the same. When we play the Headspace sections of the game, Sunny is the person whose dreams we are actually in, and as such, he is a complete human being, if you will. But the problem with being complete is that whenever one part of that whole becomes undesirable, or even unacceptable, that completeness becomes painful. Which is exactly what happened to Sunny after <laughs> that fateful day. Which, you know, you all know what I'm referring to there. Now, he solved this problem by separating his ego from the unbearable truth that gnawed at him. Hiding away his true identity and reality, and adopting an identity equivalent to the one he had before Mari's death. In a series of events worthy of examination by a Jungian psychoanalyst, Sunny relegates everything that happened in the wake of Mari's death to the depths of his unconscious, and employs Omori, both as an identity and as a guardian to prevent the unconscious from ever seeping back into the conscious mind. But this results in Sunny's mind being splintered, and the guardian he employs gains a life of its own 
making it infinitely harder for Sunny to face the truth. And, as Sunny continues to repress it, Omori starts to become the center of his identity. We see this whole phenomenon quaintly symbolized in the sketchbook, where one of the sketches in white space shows Omori centered with the red hands, another symbol, reaching out and wielding cleavers or steak knives to fend off the darkness or the truth symbolized by the tentacles and some things on the outer edge of the drawing. This little symbol, by the way, is particularly interesting to me, as it seems to be an example of something called a mandala. Mandalas are these circularish sketches, often resembling blooming flowers, and is seen in a lot of spiritual traditions, but in particular it's a phenomenon described by the psychotherapist Carl Jung as something drawn by many of his patients as a kind of representation of their inner state. But that's a whole other rabbit hole, so let me know if you want to talk about that too in another video. Essentially, the short version is that this sketch can be thought of as a representation of Sunny's self, showing how, yes, Omori is fending off the repressed contents Sunny refuses to face, but in the process, he's slowly usurping Sunny's place as the center of the self, as the psychological ego. So Sunny is basically losing his sense of self and reality, as a large part of who he is is hidden away, relegated to a dark part of his unconscious mind. The red hands reaching out from Amori are essentially his tools of control, symbols of his power to repress and eradicate anything that might threaten Sunny. Yet at their root, they're also symbols of Sunny's underlying guilt for what he's done. Because what did Sunny push Mari with? It's almost like the red hands, at first a painful reminder of the horrible action Sunny committed, are hijacked by Amori and used to push out any reminder of the truth. It's honestly quite fitting because the only way to reconcile with Mari, the real Mari that is, is to stop pushing away the truth and hiding away. Now, having established Omori's role in the story, the first sort of crevice of Sunny's mind we're acquainted with as players is, of course, white space. White space serves as the most pungent symbol of the cage that Sunny has put himself in by repressing the truth by proxy of Omori, and functions as a spatial equivalent to him. White space is essentially a representation of the state of repression and what it feels like, conveying a fleeting and dead sense of comfort. In the room, which is a vague model of Sunny's precious bedroom, all we have at our disposal is a computer containing a monotonous journal, a door, some towels to, quote, wipe your sorrows away, a kitten questioning our life choices in the most subtle way imaginable, and at last but not least, a strange black light bulb, which I'll refer to as the dark bulb because it's dark, hanging from a nondescript ceiling. Now the best way to put it is that the purpose of the towels reflects the purpose of the room we find ourselves in. White space is emptiness. A home without warmth, a place to survive, but not to live. It's the place Sunny returns to whenever fragments of the truth are threatening to reveal themselves, cutting short his sporadic adventures. It's a place where everything of substance is wiped away. And since the happy parts always have the potential of reminding us of the sad and terrifying parts, there is nothing to be found here at all. It's empty. The dark bulb hanging in the middle of the room is a representation of the unconscious and what has been hidden away and repressed. Everything that's lacking from the rest of the room, in other words. It's the result of Amori's craftsmanship, and almost gives the room the character of the yin and yang, the dark intermingling with the light. As we'll see, the darkness which Sunny hides from is hidden outside the room, which is what prompts him to hide here where everything dangerous has been stripped away, but the darkness, although repressed, is curiously also contained even within the precious room Sunny hides in, in the form of this very dark bulb. To me, this hints at how the things Sunny hides from, and the things we hide from in general as humans, 
always find a way to make themselves back into our lives. Although Sonny hides from the truth, it still finds a way to stare him right in the eyes, even when in the <laughs> safety of white space. The dynamic created through the interplay between the repressed contents of Sonny's unconscious mind and his desperate attempts to hide them away from himself like he does in white space creates the basis for the wonder and sense of mystery which permeates the entire game, which is the main reason why it's so spoiler sensitive. As Sonny slowly becomes reacquainted with his real friends in faraway town, we start to see saplings of the truth grow out from the fertile soil of his tortured mind. Something. A distorted image of Mari as Sunny saw her hanging from her favorite tree taunts us and appears intermingled with the facade of Headspace. The search for Basil, which serves as the catalyst for all the disparate adventures of Headspace, is paralleled by a much more real search for the character of Shadow Basil in Headspace, who is the dreamlike embodiment of the real Basil who in reality, of course, is suffering, completely alone, and unable to divulge the truth, which, unlike Sonny, he still remembers, and therefore has to cope with. The character of Shadow Basil can be viewed as a representation of the other side of Sonny's mind, while Omori is a sort of inner critic which suppresses the unconscious because of its irreconcilable nature, Shadow Basil is a very different part of Sonny's mind. He's the messenger of the unconscious, represented by Basil, because his struggle is so closely tied to Sonny's. And of course, the grapple between these two parts of Sonny's mind is the very conflict whose outcome we must decide as players. Now, although the character Shadow Basil is the most poignant embodiment of Sonny's unconscious, since he's the one who guides us closer and closer to the truth as we progress, the idea of Shadow Basil as the force in Sunny's psyche which resists Omori's repression and still maintains memory of the truth is represented in a plethora of interesting ways throughout Headspace proper. The most interesting of these, I'd argue, are a number of unique areas which contain fragments of Sunny's unconscious, as well as the characters I like to call the oracles. Now these are the various characters we see throughout Headspace which seem to have a special knowledge on the reality of Sonny's mind and his status as, quote, the dreamer. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of these and the roles they play as messengers and embodiments of Sonny's unconscious, or you might even call them aspects of Shadow Basil, as well as the roles they play in uncovering the truth and leading up to Sonny's descent into black space. The first of these oracle-like characters we have the choice to be acquainted with is Daddy Longlegs, who appears in the maze-like Lost Forest of a small detour from the main route in Pyrefly Forest on our third day in Headspace. Now first of all, the name Daddy Longlegs is an obvious reference to a species of spider of the same name, and seems fitting given the spider-themed environment we find him in. The name could also be interpreted in terms of the character's insight into the reality of Headspace, however. A spider whose legs stretch across the wide web of Sonny's unconscious, allowing him to provide insights which few other characters do. He and the Lost Forest are associated with the theme of being lost and unable to find one's way, naturally, a central problem Sonny is facing in the light of all the repression he's imposed on himself. But as we progress through the Lost Forest, Daddy Longlegs hints at things of increasing relevance to the story of the game in a cryptic manner which is highly characteristic of all the oracles in Headspace. For example, quote, There was a boy wandering around here before, very similar to you. He went into the darkness and never came out. How regretful it must have been to never find what he was looking for. Be it regret, defeat, or confusion, no one will know. This line seems to refer to Basil, and more specifically the real Basil, or perhaps you might say Shadow Basil. In contrast to Sunny, Basil did not repress the truth from himself, forcing him to simply wallow in the darkness rather than escape it, 
and perhaps it is both his regret, defeat, and confusion which has led him there. Regret for his unspeakable actions, and defeat and confusion at being abandoned by Sunny. On a side note, I also find it really fascinating to look back on some of the seemingly random dialogue of this character after finishing the game. For example, morals are lost on the wicked. How does one define malice without intent? Why do you continue down this path when it's almost certainly not the right way? Upon first seeing it, this quote would make no sense to the player, but after the truth, it's a subtle reference to the whole of Sunny's predicament. That day. He didn't mean it, did he? Yet, in a way, he did. It's a kind of paradox of guilt, the dwelling upon which can only really lead to self-loathing, which indeed it has. How does one define malice without intent? Anyway, the most significant aspect of this character in the Lost Forest segment is what he tells us at the end of it, once we've navigated this spiderweb forest. He provides some crucial backstory, almost like the creation myth of Headspace, telling of how the dreamer grew weary of his room and created a door that led to many different worlds. This door is of course the white door we see in Headspace, which leads out into the many different worlds, such as the vast forest, Otherworld, and the deep well. But leaving the total protection of white space had its disadvantages. Daddy Longlegs continues. Eventually, the dreamer's curiosity and clumsy exploration led him to a certain world, one not like the others, one painted with chaos and bathed in darkness, black space. As Sunny allowed himself to re-experience his fond memories of the past in headspace, it was only a matter of time until the associations brought forth by those memories would lead him to something he did not want to re-experience. And no matter how he compounded his worlds of headspace upon his world not like the others, it's still, as Daddy Longlegs says, one still has to face one's own reflection. Although the memories themselves, which Sonny desperately tries to relive, were positive, Sonny himself could not be the one to re-experience them. His guilt was incompatible with this very world. What he created was something outside himself. Sonny's very identity was so tainted by the guilt and self-loathing from the aftermath of what happened that trying to re-experience the innocent past could only ever lead him to one realization. The reality of how that innocent past came to an abrupt end. And that was the birth of Omori. An agent of repression, yes, but also a version of Sunny cleansed of all guilt, of all baggage, a reversion to a previous version of himself. I think that's the key message here. Only memories of the past, like Omori, can experience the past the way it actually happened. There's a reason nostalgia is a bittersweet emotion and not a happy one. Looking back on the past always reminds one of how things have changed since then. But for Sunny, <laughs> that isn't just bittersweet. It's catastrophic. And so he chose to forget himself. But in spite of all his efforts, of course, forgetful the dreamer may be of this peril, a peril never forgets to be. After progressing a ways further in the game, and as is a common theme, Getting temporarily distracted? In the midst of all of Sweetheart's antics, there appears another, very minor character who despite its minor role is worth mentioning in my opinion. The Keeper of the Castle can be found in a somewhat hidden location in Sweetheart's Castle and serves as a sort of deal with the devil character 
who can supposedly grant you your greatest desires. In his dialogue, we learn that he was the original being to grant Sweetheart all of her deepest desires, which naturally enough consisted of riches, servants for her to command, and a stage for her to flaunt her power. Yet, we see how well that went for her as an individual. Despite all her extravagance and worship by the Sprout Moles, she's not one step closer to being an individuated and happy person. This is relevant because in the Hikikomori route of the game, we as players are given the option to take Sweetheart's place as the owner of the castle. If we accept this deal from the Keeper, the expansive and extravagant castle will shrink and transform into a very simple and peaceful room, known as the Lamp Room, where Omori can sit calmly, listening to the birds chirping and the wind blowing at peace. The Lamp Room, also found briefly towards the true ending of the game, is a representation of peace, serenity, and innocence. It serves as a haven, almost an improved version of white space, where Sunny can re-experience what it feels like to not be burdened by what happened. His greatest desire, that nothing bad ever happened in the first place. Yet ultimately, in the same way that Sweetheart's elaborate castle didn't make her any happier in the end, this lamp room is not a true resolution to Sunny's condition. And this is the essential point about the Keeper of the Castle, and what his character is meant to express. Like I said, accepting this deal is essentially accepting a deal with the devil. Sunny's greatest desire may have been that nothing bad ever happened, but something bad did happen and he can't overcome that by living in the nostalgic past. Like Daddy Longlegs says at one point, I'm not much of a wants kind of person. I'm more of a needs kind of person. And although he may want it, the lamp room is not what Sunny needs. It's yet another distraction. After having progressed through the rest of the segment in Sweetheart's Castle, another very interesting and important section of the game follows. The Lost Library. Buried deep underneath the castle, it's the archetypal place to hide away dark secrets or long since forgotten truths. Here, we learn about a number of Sunny's memories of the past, mostly either happy or neutral memories. And judging by the number of books, we can perhaps assume it's meant to represent the set of all of Sunny's real memories, however, as there are mountains of books forgotten through time. Perhaps they were hidden away, forgotten, for the same reason Sunny himself is hidden away and replaced by Omori. Whereas reliving the past in the fantastical world of Headspace provides a distraction, these memories, with all their reality, would perhaps only threaten to remind Sunny of what he doesn't want to remember. I also find it a little interesting how the names have been blotted out and replaced by these squares, almost like the faces scribbled out of the photo album, as if to try to render the memories impersonal and inconsequential. But it's pretty obvious who's who, so I'll just spell it out when I talk about them. Now, what we learn from these memories is interesting because, besides being fond memories, they also tell us a little bit about why and how Sunny is struggling, about what kind of person he actually is. In the school day memory, for instance, we learn how Sunny used to spend his school days gazing listlessly through the window, daydreaming in his own intuitive mindscape rather than focusing on the class, something I can relate to personally and which is a habit clearly carried over and repurposed as a coping mechanism in the years following, in the form of headspace. The memory about the lake, and how Sunny fell from the statue, tells of the origins of all the fears which have grown and magnified after Mari's death. How he stood atop a statue, trembling from the height, and as he notices a spider on his shoulder, he loses all sense and hurls himself into the lake. 
He exerts his limbs, but the water is stronger. And it's only after Mari, rather than Kellen Hero, as it says here, saves him that he gets out. This is the almost poetic convergence of all of Sunny's worst fears, or phobias, as well as Mari, the four devils of Sunny's mind, if you will. And it's a moment whose aftermath plagues him until he finally overcomes it at the end of the game. He's too weak, too helpless, or that is what he believes. It's precisely this belief, embodied in this memory, that we as players must help Sunny overcome. Finally, the most perplexing of these areas in Oracle-like characters, in my opinion, is the deeper well, and the branch coral we find at the end of it. We first reach this area after getting through the last resort, which is a really clever name, by the way, as it isn't just any resort, it's not Wii Sports Resort, it's the beginning of Omori's last resort to hide away the truth from Sunny. The fact that gambling and other indulgences, like we see throughout this section, are often used as coping mechanisms by those suffering psychologically, like someone else we know, should definitely not go lost on you either. But I simply don't have time to talk about that, so moving on. Once we get through the last resort, the deeper well, much like the lost forest, conveys a theme of being lost, but furthermore, of emptiness, void, and in particular, forgetfulness. This is first made clear once we cross the bridge, and Hero, Kel, and Aubrey express the fact that they don't exactly remember what Basil looks like. It's already hinted at previously, and again reflects the resistance of Sunny to face his unconscious, as Omori tries to remove the very memory of Basil, the only string we can trace to find the truth in the midst of all the distractions, and the objective of the main quest of the entire headspace section of the game. Almost all the NPCs in this area have names which correspond to the theme of decay or a lack of something, like one's memories, for instance. Many of them dance around this topic, or the topics of limitations, faults, and the need to move on. Cypher directly references Mari's death, and the name is quite fitting, really, as it hints at the idea that this is a cipher which must at first be tied to Mari, and then, after the end of the game, to the whole truth, in order to be fully understood, or deciphered, if you will. And another NPC, Polo, asks the fascinating question, The last time you fell into deep water, were you truly saved? Or were you cursed? This of course refers to Sunny's near-death experience, which we already learned about in the Lost Library, and the key point is, he was saved by Mari. He couldn't manage to swim to the surface himself. The point here is that Sonny has been relying too much on others in his life to help him get through things. Again, he believes too much his own idea that he's too weak and too helpless to save himself. So in a sense, he's been cursed by being helped and saved so many times by others, so that now that he's all alone, he's stuck and unable to help himself. As the last NPC I'd like to mention, Parvenu says, quote, What if it's up to you? What if it's only up to you? Carry on, dreamer. You are the only one who can. Almost like asking, waiting for something to happen? Are you expecting someone else to save you, or...? For something to change? Because nothing ever will, unless it's your choice. All these characters serve as a prelude, almost like little minions leading up to the branch coral. And when we finally reach it, we see Shadow Basil sitting at a swing hanging off of it, reflecting him and the branch coral's shared identity as messengers or representations of Sunny's repressed, unconscious contents leading him closer 
and closer to that, quote, world not like the others, which is mentioned by Daddy Longlegs. And the swing also evokes the theme of childhood and the past in general. Now, similarly to Daddy Longlegs, the branch coral provides some extremely interesting information on the nature of headspace. It's mainly the branch coral which provides the insight into the origin of white space, which I've already discussed in some detail. But it also talks about Basil, who most of the members of the headspace team have forgotten by now. Quote, The friend you have lost is not in this world. The day he was removed, he was reborn elsewhere. He is special to you. A string of fate ties you two together. He cannot leave that place alone. This refers to how Basil is now in red space, the remote part of Sunny's psyche from which Omori represses everything. The day that Basil saw that glimpse of the truth, he was removed by Omori. And in fact, this is the pattern Sunny keeps repeating in his dreams. As we learn from Daddy Longlegs, he's constructed all manner of elaborate defenses against this leakage from black space, choosing to forget his own identity and manifesting benevolent entities like the big yellow cat and burying black space underneath the innocent facade he's chosen to hide in. But no matter how many times he hides the truth in his dream world, the unconscious keeps flowing back. In each of his adventures, Basil always finds a way to rediscover it because of his intrinsic connection to it. And Omori always banishes him again and again. But, as the branch coral says, this journey is nearing its end. Sunny will soon once again have the option of facing the truth. At this stage of the game, he's about to figuratively delve into the belly of the beast by entering black space, which, by the way, is foreshadowed by literally delving into the belly of the beast Humphrey, the big whale, in the final section of headspace. And on a side note, this little detail is also sort of interesting, as the idea of delving into the belly of the beast, or in other words, the underworld, is a really common mythological theme associated with facing one's demons, so I find it really interesting that Irma Cat chose to include the Humphrey segment just before we enter into black space, as opposed to any other section of the game. Anyway, um, the most peculiar aspect of the branch coral, I think, is the sacrifice we have the choice of making or accepting at the end of all its dialogue, which seems a bit counterintuitive based on its apparent desire to help Sunny face the truth rather than enabling his avoidance. He says, quote, There is a challenge that will aid you greatly in this world. It is simple, without thought, and if you succeed, I will be gone as well. Upon accepting the branch coral's offer, we're sent into one of these little pocket dimensions, which show up every now and then, in which a shallow pool of water, or perhaps not quite water, covers the ground as a juicy red apple is hanging off of a dead tree. This apple is Sunny. Upon interacting with it, it transforms into his head, and eating it prompts this very unsettling chewing noise as we're shown a distorted image of Sunny in his near-death experience he had before being saved by Mari. Doing this will give Omori a stat boost, and evidently seems to symbolize Omori gaining power at the expense of Sunny's true self. The tendrils reaching out as Sunny floats lifelessly as he's submerged evoke both death and the idea of having given up, just as he gave up that day and let someone else save him from drowning, rather than swimming up to the surface. And the juiciness of the apple suggests how tempting it is to simply give up and float aimlessly, whether it be by truly drowning or, more likely, simply surviving in a place without warmth. And I think that's the point here. The branch coral doesn't want Omori to usurp Sunny. It doesn't want us to give up. But actions speak louder than words. It's already said what it needed to say. So now, it's showing us what exactly it means to continue down the path 
that Sunny has been on for the last three years. It is simple without thought. But if you thought about it, even for a minute, you might realize how detrimental it is to let this happen. It's oh so tempting to let the true self wither and die and get replaced by a false yet comforting phantom of the past. But make no mistake, it is death which we see for ourselves as the branch coral withers away and dies after we eat the apple. The apple was a fragment of Sunny's true identity, speaking to us through the branch coral. And now that he is gone, it is gone as well. But that's fine because it made its point. And on another side note, I also want to mention how weirdly impactful this sequence was to me. There's something about how it's presented, how symbolically rich it is, and how everything fits together so well that really got under my skin when I first played it. The way the shadowy hands reach out as if to say, please, Sonny, come back to us. But that might just be me. Anyhow... That concludes what I wanted to say about the branch coral, and essentially what I wanted to talk about in this video. From Omori as an agent of repression, to Shadow Basil as an agent of the truth, and from the mystery of the lost forest to Omori's last resort to protect Sunny from the truth, the way the game leverages so many different hints, symbols, and little details to point towards the truth and where it's hidden is extremely impressive to me. And I've honestly barely scratched the surface here. I've only talked about headspace and only certain parts of it. For example, I could have talked about black space and the ending of the game, about the plethoric flower symbolism all over the place, or the symbolism around Mari and the afterlife, or the role of music and the two instruments we see in the game. Like I said, I have a 10,000 word document about the symbolism in this game, and it's not even done, so if you'd like me to explore more, especially Black Space and the Truth segment, I encourage you to like the video because honestly, it's just the reception of this video, if it gets any at all, that is, that will determine whether I make more. For the time being though, I really enjoyed making this, so thanks for watching and <laughs> congratulations on reaching the end of this jumbled mess.